Paul taught by what is called catechism. He taught by repeating over and over again a certain message until everybody was established in that message. Okay? And remember Esau and Jacob. Esau wanted to rush ahead and have a big party after the reconciliation. And Jacob said, no, I can't do that because I have little ones, I have uh, tender sheep here, and I have lambs, and I have the, uh, the calves here, and I have children here, and if we race ahead, we're going to lose that, those, those little ones. And that's a great, a, a great wisdom in that, because many times we want to race ahead, our spiritual ones want to race ahead and race ahead in our growth, forgetting that we must move together as a body if we're going to really be a church. In the Old Testament, man was dualistic in nature. He had an external man and he had an internal man, the inner man. The only trouble was that the gospel or that old covenant could not touch the inner man. In other words, the blood of the goats and the bulls and the, and the sprinkling of the ashes of the heifer could only cleanse the flesh. And you find this, by the way, in Hebrews chapter 9 and in verse 13. But it could not touch the inner spirit of man because that covenant was based on the offerings and the blood of goats and bulls. It was not at that time. It was symbolic of the blood of Christ, but it didn't have the power to touch the inner life. So to bless people, God had to uh, send an expression of his character, his nature. And so the Ten Commandments are virtually an expression of the character of Christ or the character of God. And that it was expressed outwardly in the form of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do something else, and so forth. And that was considered to be righteousness. Whenever somebody conformed to that law, they were considered to be righteous. And righteousness, according to the Old Testament, was to be conformed to the will of God in thought and in word and in deed. So that while anybody was conforming to the righteousness of God, which is basic fellowship, then that person then could be blessed of God. So while ever he was in righteousness or in right relationship with God, that person could be blessed. But it wasn't established by faith, it was established on a covenant of works or keeping the law. And we know that in the New Testament now that's been done away with and the covenant now is established by what we say and we believe rather than what we do. Amen? So we need to remember that in our application of it. So what happened? You see, there was this imperfect covenant because it could not touch the inner man. And so what the Lord did was he said, I'll make a new covenant with you. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to sprinkle you with water. I'm going to give you a new heart. And in that new heart, I'm going to put my spirit, my character, my nature, and that's why the Bible says, without the Spirit of Christ, we are none of His. That doesn't mean the baptism of the Holy Ghost, as some has taught. But unless we have the nature of Christ within us, we are not Christ. Why? Because a child will reproduce the character of its father. So if we don't have the character of Christ, it means we're not His. Amen? So we have the Spirit of Christ. Now in this new covenant, God has given us a new heart. And in that new heart, he has placed his law. He said, I will write my law upon their hearts and their minds. Now, one of the things we have dealt with in the past, and maybe it would be good for me to just go over it again, here we have people today that are still dualistic in, in quality and in character in that we have this rebirth now. We've been reborn of the Spirit of God. We have the nature of Christ now dwelling within us. But sometimes, unless we know the fullness of the sacrifice of Christ, then we can still be like Paul in Romans chapter 7, having trouble with our flesh. And being in that wretched position as a Christian of delighting after the law of God, after the inward man, but the external man now still having conflict with its habits and things. And coming into that place of desperation, as Paul was saying, the good that I would I could not, the evil which I would not, that I do, a wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And see, that's a cry of a man who's trying to be free by the works of the law. Because in Romans chapter 7 he says, I speak to those that know the law, that the law has dominion and power over man as long as that man liveth. 
But if, and he gives the example of a husband and wife relationship, if one partner is dead, there is no bondage any longer. There's no law that can hold that relationship together or bind that dead person to the living one because law has severed that relate, or rather death has severed that relationship. So he said in Romans 7, I speak to those that know the law. What was he talking about? He's saying that the flesh has dominion, and in the area of the flesh there we have the law of sin and death. That's not LSD, by the way. It's the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death will operate in the flesh of man until the man is dead. Because then we have all the negative preachers who say, well, I told you so. We can never ever be changed until we die. You know, and we can have all this freedom, all this liberty when we get to heaven, but we can't have it down here on earth. Pity, pity, pity me, a wretched man that I am. I just have to be content to live with all these habits in my life, all these weaknesses in my life, and I just can't help it now. That's the way God made me, and that's the way I'll be until I die. Now, you've heard that kind of philosophy, haven't you? Go on, blink an eyebrow. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Okay, but that's not what the Bible teaches. And when Paul said, A wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He goes on to say, I thank my God through Jesus Christ. Amen? And then he tells us in Romans chapter 8, 2 and 3, what the law could not do, being weak in the flesh, God sending his Son in the likeness of sin for flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Glory be to God. And it goes on to say, liberating and setting one free to be able to live by the new life, the power of the new life now, if we accept that part of the sacrifice that brings death to this old nature, the old man. Glory be to God. Isn't that good news? <laughs> and what is that part of the sacrifice? The part of that sacrifice is expressed by the scapegoat offering. And there you have two little goats. And one, the lot was cast, and one fell to the little goat that was called the holy offering. The offering without spot, the offering without blemish, which represents to us the holy, spotless, blameless Son of God that was died on Calvary for our sins and shed his precious, holy, spotless blood for the remission of man's sin, which means that now I can be reborn of the Spirit of God. I can have a spiritual rebirth. Glory be to God. I can come alive on the inside now and be quickened and declared righteous by God in my spirit because of that holy, blameless offering of the Son of God, that spotless offering there on Calvary. But what about my flesh? And that was covered by God, by the way. It was covered by God by the other offering of the little goat. And the high priest would come and lay his head upon the scapegoat and all the iniquities and all the weaknesses and all the sins were laid upon the head of that little goat and then that little goat was driven out from the wilderness to die. Amen. And that was a type of Christ who became sin for us. He's the type of Christ who that spotless one there on Calvary. And then the Father had said it pleased the Father to bruise him. He had made him sick with our iniquities, with our sins. And the Father laid the iniquity and the sin and the weakness of the flesh upon that holy offering that was hanging there on Calvary. And Jesus, that holy one, became sin and died as a sinner and was carried to hell as a sinner and suffered punishment in hell for us as a sinner. And I believe from the scripture that wasn't down just in the grave. It was in a lake of fire where nobody has ever gone yet. But that spotless son of God who became sin, died in spirit, went down there into hell, suffered the punishment of, a, of hell for us eternally, and then rose again, was quickened in spirit, rose up again, glory be to God, and is now the ever-living one who offers us this kind of salvation and this kind of redemption. So when I accept the fact right now in this present life that one died for all, then all are dead, glory be to God, that when Jesus was hanging there on the cross, he took me in himself, and when he died, I died, glory be to God, amen, that no longer now need I be under the subjection to the old nature, the old character, the old sin man, but now through the power of the cross of Christ, the old sin life within me, the law of sin and death has been banished forever. Hallelujah. 
I am now free now to choose to do good or evil, but the choice is mine. And it's not because I'm bound by some monster within me now that's trying to, that I can't help sinning now. I have the freedom of choice now. And if I sin, I have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen. Oh, ho, ho. I'm going to get a little excited. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Because we have people that are still living under the oppression of that old life, not realizing that the only way that they can be free is if they die. And because one died for all, then all are dead. Glory be to God. God looks at you as a Christian, and, and by the light of Calvary today, he says your flesh is dead. You are to reckon yourself indeed dead under sin, but now that you're alive under God through Jesus Christ the Lord, you should be sending your body unto him as though you were resurrected. Hallelujah. Amen. As those who are alive from the dead. I want to tell you today, today that I'm dead, but I'm alive. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, come on, that's the message. And you see, we can talk about counseling, we can talk about getting rid of this habit, we can talk about something else, but unless you understand this message, 90% of you will still be in bondage because the fact that you don't see that in your flesh the cross, the shadow of that cross has come, and the shadow of that cross has accounted you to be dead with Christ in flesh, and that now you can reckon yourself to be alive under God. And what do I do with this old life of mine now? I leave it where it belongs. I leave it out on the garbage dump. I leave it out on Calvary where it belongs outside the city. And I come into the presence of God now. And I present to God my body now. Not as an instrument of sin, but an instrument of righteousness. As those who are alive from the dead. Hallelujah. But I can't come into God's holy presence and offer him a bunch of garbage. <sighs> Forgive me for saying it. He can't give his glory, brethren, to another. He can't touch the flesh. He can't anoint the flesh. He said, I've condemned the flesh forever. It's banished from my sight. It's banished from my life. And the only way that God can accept your flesh is to have it come through the cross. And when it comes through the cross, it's crucified. And when it's crucified, it's buried. And when it's buried, it goes through resurrection. Hallelujah. And one day the finality of that will become a living reality when that trumpet sounds. All that God has said about my body will then become a living reality. Amen. But till that point, I'm to yield myself as though I'm alive from the dead and I've got to present my body as something that is alive and not something that's dead. Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, get excited about it. Because if you could only understand that, there would be a liberating power within your life. So what have we been saying? Oh, I'm just going back and recapping now what I've been preaching over the last ten months. But let me tell you something. Daily, we are to live as though we're dead and we're alive. Glory be to God. Amen. And as we do that, then a tremendous power shall be released in our bodies. I have seen miracles of healing. One of the greatest miracles of healing, healing I ever witnessed once happened when I was preaching a message like that. And a man had epilepsy, had it from childhood. He's a man of about 40 or 50 years of age. That thing had thrown him into a fire many, many times. He had scar tissue all over his body. He was crippled up. He had to creep along on a walking stick like that. And that night when we were preaching that, the Holy Spirit came upon him and people saw a glow of light come all over that man. And that scar tissue was removed from his body. And I want to tell you, his flesh became like the flesh of a little child. And he put aside his walking stick and he began to walk and move and he was totally free. Not by preaching healing, brethren, but by preaching life. Glory be to God. And that's what the Lord wants us to share in. He wants to share in life, not death. Praise God. Amen. Every sickness and every disease here in this meeting today could be healed if you could see the reality of this was the message of healing of the New Testament not going around saying if you have faith to be healed if you have faith to be healed it was an understanding of how God considered your body what is your body your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost your body had been purchased by the blood of Jesus you are to yield your body now as an instrument of righteousness and I want to tell you the same spirit that has quickened your spirit will reach out and touch your body and bring it to life. Hallelujah. Amen. 
the same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead that lives in you will quicken your mortal body and bring it to life, praise God. Is that a reality? It sure is. It may, we may not be walking in it all the time. You know, I often said if I could preach for 24 hours a day, I'd never suffer any pain. I would never have one ache in my body. I'd have no limitations. Because when I begin to minister and I begin to move under the Spirit of God, every pain will leave my body, every weakness disappears, every disability goes, every deformity is taken care of under the anointing of God's Spirit. And if we could learn how to live 24 hours a day under that same anointing, under that same consecration, under the same dedication, nothing would ever touch us in our bodies. And I believe that the message to the church is to come to that place, and you'll find this in Philippians chapter 3, by the way. Amen? And there's a process of getting there, which one day, if the Lord leads, we'd like to share into it how to get to that place. Praise God. But that's another story.